and welcome to Showcase. Today, Iraqi art, trauma in Lebanon, and Damien Hurst. We'll take a trip to the desert with Hassan Masoudi. Artists continue to cope with August's explosions in Beirut. And Damien Hurst is looking back to the 1990s. He's been called the greatest living calligrapher. In his more than 45-year career, Hassan Masoudi has pushed the limits of the ancient art form with his contemporary approach. Masoudi is back with his latest book, Calligraphies of the Desert. He was born in Najaf, Iraq, a city on the edge of the desert. Through his brush strokes, he tries to depict its breathtaking beauty and wonder. Along the way, he draws inspiration from the words of poets and writers such as Rumi, Goethe and Khalil Gibran. Let's talk to curator, writer and producer Rose Issa. Hi Rose, good to have you back on our show. So, I just said that uh, he was, he's been called the greatest living calligrapher. What would you say to that? Do you think he actually is the greatest living calligrapher? I find those uh, adjectives a little bit over the top because you have to know a lot of other uh, calligraphers in order to judge. I don't like judging. He's probably one of the most important contemporary calligraphers, yes. Uh, three years ago, I did a book called Signs of Our Times, where I included 50 uh, artists who work on the base of ca calligraphists who, ba who work with the words. And he was among the 50, there were only 50 calligraphers. And Hassan Masoudi as one of the five, somewhere from Iran and uh, elsewhere, uh, Egypt and elsewhere. Uh, but I think he's uh, extremely important because... Uh, Already by 1980 in France, he had books published, which very few uh, Arab uh, or Iranian uh, calligraphers had any book published then. So he made his name very well known right away in Paris where he went. And uh, uh, that were almost the very few books that were monographies that were available on any Arab artist uh, and certainly on a calligrapher were his. And he, that's why he influenced many, many future calligraphers. Mm -hmm. And one of them being El Seed. He said that um, Hassan Masoudi completely revolutionized the art of calligraphy. He said that it would be a little bit too much uh, for anyone to say that, uh, that that person is the greatest living calligrapher, etc. Do you think this is, almost, this is also a little bit of a stretch? Do you think he completely revolutionized the field? I think he did revolutionize the field because he brought a new aesthetic to the traditional calligraphy. You know, a calligrapher is usually somebody with a traditional diploma on calligraphy. Uh, and contemporary artists, most of them don't want to be called calligraphers because what they do is to use the morphology of the letter rather than uh, be excellent in calligraphy. What they want is a new aesthetic, a new visual, a new concept. But in the case of uh, Hassan Masoud, he managed to do that. He managed to do that very, very modestly. He had a very modest start, but he knew the importance of publication. He knew the importance of uh, making uh, his work available to others. And that's why he inspired so many artists. Uh, uh, El Cid is one of them. El Cid was influenced by Hassan uh, Masoudi and also by Nja Mahdawi. For example, the artworks you see behind me is by Nja Mahdawi, where you cannot read any word. It's the opposite, a little bit of Hassan Masoudi, where Hassan Masoudi takes uh, um, inspiration from proverbs by Rumi, by uh, Hafez, Saadi, uh, uh, French, uh, Saint-Exupéry, uh, Khalil Gibran, etc., etc. He takes uh, old and new, contemporary poets and old poets. Uh, so Hassan Masoudi has always something to say. He is a, an artist who uses his writing, and the writing uh, can be uh, not always, but most of the time, very readable. <coughs> Excuse me. And he puts his, uh, he conveys the message which touched him uh, visually. Mm -hmm. So you have um, proverbs, you have uh, short sentences, short poems. Um, that uh, really moved him and he wants to move us and educate us and bring a bit of wisdom to the world of we live in. 
I don't think he wants to compete uh, in terms of conceptually or aesthetically, just that his, his calligraphy developed naturally with his effort, with some 40 years of career. I remember the first time uh, I saw his book and I met him was uh, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. You said that his uh, career evolved naturally, but then he studied figurative painting. He's, he's excellent in calligraphy, just like you said, in the traditional sense, but he also studied um, Western uh, you know, art. So how did, how did this contribute to his uh, art, do you think, his calligraphy, his style? I think the Western art, uh, many, many artists from the Arab world and develop, most of the developing countries have to come almost in Europe or America or somewhere in order to have Western art and uh, have access to contemporary art scene. However, he found that very quickly maybe because already the Iranian artists with uh, La Maison de l'Iran in Paris and other uh, art critics were influencing that what is best is to be yourself. If you want to be unique, you cannot go. If you want to compete in figurative art, you have to compete with hundreds of Westerners, Brazilians, African and others. While if you go to something that belongs to your culture, which is calligraphy, and the essence of the verb, uh, the proverbs or the verb or the words of wisdom, then uh, you become unique. And uniqueness is the important thing for an artist. I find him that he is an artist before and anything else who uses calligraphy to express himself. Mm -hmm. And what kind of a career or what kind of an artistic journey do you think he would have if he didn't leave Iraq? Uh, you know, sometimes you find your country when you're outside of your country and you feel uh, maybe it's a feeling of loss or a feeling of uniqueness. Maybe if he did calligraphy in Iraq, he wouldn't be in unique because there are some 20 calligraphers in Iraq who are very good at the moment or there were at that time. So if you want to be unique, you have to go out. You have to find your roots, but you have also to find um, the competitive scene of Western Europe or America or Canada or elsewhere or Australia. You have to compete with the rest of the world. And this is what makes you uh, stand out. What makes him stand out as is nobody else is from Najaf, who does calligraphy, who lives in Paris, who has captured what, what can he translate in art, what can he express in art that is unique. Mm -hmm. And that capture, to, to capture and to uh, transmit that feeling is uh, unique to him. Okay, so we talked about how he influenced a, a generation of uh, mostly calligraphy artists, I reckon. W who were his influences, you think? Uh, was it only traditional calligraphy artists or what would you say? Yeah, I think it was uh, the basis of it. Because as I told you, I did a book with 50 artists who use calligraphy, not all of them, none of almost... Five of them only said that they are calligrapher. None of the others said they are calligrapher. What he learned is that calligraphy is a technique. You have to go to schools and learn it from a master. But what he learned also, I think, by coming to Europe, uh, was having access to Chinese calligraphy, to Japanese, to big strokes, brushes, things that uh, in the Middle East usually is limited to small paper or manuscripts. The calligraphy was always in small uh, format. And suddenly Europe allowed him to, to see other cultures, whether Asian culture or European culture, and see bigger and in different uh, format and support. Okay, Rose, uh, it was lovely talking to you. Thanks a lot for joining us on Showcase today. My pleasure. Thank you. To recover both emotionally and financially from the Beirut blasts in August, a group of artists are expressing their anger with an exhibition. Nur Sena has more. Beirut Year Zero is titled after the 1948 film Germany Year Zero. 54 artists put together this exhibition. All the proceeds from these paintings, installations and sculptures will go to the families affected by the Beirut port blasts that happened in August. The idea was to raise money for the Red Cross. Uh, so the Red Cross is taking 50% of the sale. Uh, the other 50% is going to the artists. The reason is because they, a lot of them have lost their studios, they lost their way of life 
and uh, no and anymore, and they were not doing great with the economic crisis yeah. anyway to start with. As well as financial aid, this exhibition also helps emotionally. British artist Tom Young has been living in Lebanon for over a decade and his painting The Great Silo was inspired by the Beirut Port Silo. The building bore the most of the explosion, shielding many other buildings. Young says the silo probably saved hundreds of lives and he wanted to process his feelings. And I almost need to paint now um, to do something with this pain and this anger, to transform it into something creative that I can share with others that hopefully will help in some sort of healing process. It certainly does help me process what's happened. So, you know, for example, this painting of the, the great silo, um, you know, I've really unleashed a lot of energy and I'm painting in a much more free way, a much more gestural way, um, using the paint, slashing at it, cutting at it, you know, channeling that energy. The curator says they're helping the artists to transform their anger into art. And after that, 30 out of 100 displayed works will go to London to be auctioned at Christie's. Iraq is known for its poets, painters, sculptors and string artists. Well, not that last one. It's definitely a niche genre. But artist Said Hawidi hopes to change that. This is what Said Hawidi's work looks like once it's completed. But getting there takes time and patience. First, Hawidi places nails on a wooden board and then he pulls out his string and gets to work. As string art is not a popular art form in Iraq, the self-taught artist had to learn it the hard way. To reach this level, I didn't fail a hundred pieces until, thank God, I reached my current level. This art is rare at a global level. There are only a few string artists. In Iraq, it is not present at all. String art, thread art, or philography's origins date back to the end of the 19th century. It's believed that it was developed from the curve stitch method that was a way to help children understand mathematics. It became popular as a decorative craft in the late 1960s through kits and books. As for Hawidi, he found out about the art form thanks to a gift he received, a philography portrait. I really liked the idea and began to look for and learn this art through practice and perseverance. And he's been doing so for the past two years. Once he learned the basics, he moved on to portraits. This one is a tribute to the late Iraqi footballer Ahmed Radi. And this one features Portuguese player Cristiano Ronaldo. To be honest, I consider this to be my source of income. I practice this art and have sold many paintings. There are different levels. In the beginning, I wasn't doing portraits because portraits are very difficult and need a high level of concentration and energy. An effort that can take up to 15 days. But Hawidi doesn't feel like his work is getting the recognition it deserves, as it's difficult to sell pieces at a good price in Iraq. String by string, he hopes to change that and make a name not only in his country, but around the world. Sofia Coppola. She's known for making moving, intimate films. And at the peak of her career is lost in translation. Now she's made what's called the spiritual sequel to that film. Even Bill Murray is back. So let's check out On the Rocks. Hi, Dad. Hey, kiddo. Oh my gosh, do you look beautiful. You live. How's your mom's hips? Good, thanks. Good. 
Unrock tells the story of Laura. She thinks her husband is cheating. But to make sure, she seeks help from her father Felix, played by Bill Murray. The duo play detective on the trail of Laura's better half across New York. Raise your hand if that sounds fishy. I just don't know what I'm supposed to be. You'll figure that out. The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. Mary's inclusion into the film sparked comparisons to 2003's Lost in Translation. That movie also looks at a young woman's marriage and her friendship to an old Tinseltown star, also played by Murray. You're probably just uh, having a midlife crisis. He's not like you. He's a good guy, a great dad. Sure. Casting aside, both films also have a hint of being semi-biographical. Lost in Translation provides a glimpse into Coppola's marriage to director Spike Jones. Now on the Rocks recreates another relationship with a filmmaker, Francis Ford Coppola. Sophia has said the film was born out of the conversations she had about relationships with her father. Similarities aside, reviewers say these two films have a major difference. Coppola's entire career is marked by dramas, and On the Rocks is very much a light-hearted comedy. Bill Murray uses his signature deadpan humor, and just like in Lost in Translation, reviews praise his performance. The other possible difference? Well, The Guardian says On the Rocks lacks substance, and that's a letdown. That could mean that, unlike Lost in Translation, this film won't be seeing too many Oscar nods. I don't know why women get plastic surgery. Because of men like you. Mm -mm. I prefer the factory original. <laughs> yeah, and every other make and model. Thank you. I'm going to take that as a compliment. Contemporary artist Damien Hirst made a splash in the 1990s. And the man who's never been afraid to shock his fans has been nostalgic with a new show in London. Let's take a peek. He was one of the most controversial artists in the 1990s British art scene. Damien Hirst has been reminiscing about his gallery's early years at London's Newport Street. His new show is called End of Century, which he says makes him feel even older. And doing a retrospective came to Hirst unexpectedly. I hadn't really decided what the next show was going to be, um, but I felt a little bit nervous about putting, you know, a friend of mine in there or another artist in there without knowing the landscape and if people are going to actually turn up or anything like that. And then for a long while, I've been thinking about doing something um, with my own work because a lot of people turn up at the gallery and say, where's Damien's work? And they're always a bit disappointed when it's not there. So I just suddenly thought, well, why not use this as an opportunity to try and do something, you know, retrospective with my own work. The show includes more than 50 installations, paintings and sculptures from the 80s and 90s. Back then, Hearst was still a student, dominating the British art scene with his contemporaries like Tracy Emin. Natural History. This iconic series where his tanks of preserved sharks and other animals are on display. And some of the works have never before been shown in public. I think it felt like a massive celebration and I felt immortal in some way. So it's quite funny to sort of see the works in here and they, you know, they look a little bit old and there's broken and there's, you know, pencil marks. Things are aging in a kind of nostalgic way. Whereas at the time I really thought I was immortal and it would never stop. Hurst says he worried about exhibiting other artists during the coronavirus outbreak. And that was one of the reasons behind making a solo show. But he was one of the lucky few who could indulge himself in the confines of his studio during the pandemic. I mean, I've been really lucky, really, because I was painting on my own from sort of before COVID. So I managed to sort of get into a situation where it was just me in the studio. And I had a couple of assistants who were helping me. So when COVID hit, um, I just stopped using those guys. And then, uh, you know, I just started, you know, mixing my paints, cleaning my own brushes, God forbid. Um, but they were the, that, that was the only changes, really. And I had a driver who isolates. So what kept me sane, really, was being able to go to the studio every day and paint. It's ironic, then, that during a time when disease is rampant, Hearst's sanity comes from showing off a collection that's obsessed with death and decay. In 
insanity can be defined by repeating the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Well, for ceramicist Alev Ebuzia, repetition has been the key to her success for the past 50 years. The artist explained why to showcase Sena Aslan. A Danish philosopher once asked, what is repetition? Almost two centuries later, Danish-Turkish ceramic artist Alev Ebuzia is trying to answer the question with a solo exhibition at Istanbul's Artar Museum. I thought to myself, what on earth am I going to show? What will the concept of, of the exhibition would be? So as uh, people say, and which is true, that I make nothing but bowls, pots, call it whatever you want, containers. I said, okay, I will underline that I am making nothing but bowls. So I decided that, uh, and I had read uh, Kierkegaard's repetition about three years ago, and I wanted to take this as an idea, repeat the same form and show the differences of the forms which are never the same. I mean, you'll see in the exhibition three, four, five different types of forms, which I have repeated consciously, willingly. The crafty task of creating the same form over and over again, Ebu Ziya says, has its own difficulties. But in the end, each clay piece comes alive like an individual with its own history. I mean, even if you try to do exactly the same as the one you've done before, it never works out. Because the clay has a resistance. Uh, you fight with the clay. I mean, it doesn't always do what you want it to do. So there is a huge fight and dialogue with, while you're working with the bowl, which makes it alive. And especially the technique I use, which is a coiling technique. I make large bands and add them on top of each other on a kick wheel. And you can see the fingerprints too. Clay remembers everything you do. In her nearly 50-year career, her work have won several awards and have been added to the royal collections of Denmark and England, as well as the Tokyo Imperial Palace collection in Japan. Now she is showing her devotion to mastering ceramics at Artar's reopening after a COVID-19 break. Clay has been so accessible to everybody and it's such a nice material to work with that people love to, to work with clay, but I don't think that a ceramic becomes better because it's a sculpture. I think a teapot, a correct teapot, is much more important than a bad ceramic sculpture. I mean, it doesn't become art when you do a sculpture in clay because it's sculpture. Ceramic has other demands. In his book Repetition, Kierkegaard also asked about the significance of repeating something and whether anything is gained or lost in such a process. For the 82-year-old master, she says she owes her career to repeating the same thing over and over again. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. Around 10 years ago, Rwanda didn't have much of a public art scene. That changed when an NGO set out on a mission to address social issues through paint and color. Kurema Kureba Kuiga means to create, to see, to learn. It's also the name of a Rwandan organization set up in 2013 to tackle social challenges through public art. In a country where more than 200,000 adults are living with HIV, the nonprofit's biggest focus has been breaking the stigma related to the virus. But another virus is in the picture now. That's why Kurema artists are working across the capital Kigali to remind residents how to fight it. This COVID thing, this COVID-19 thing wants attention. You have to see it. So I'm using strong colors to, to attract attention to my artwork, to attract attention to my message, to show that uh, people need to, to see what they should do. Not just having it disappear in the background. So my color choice was to attract people and show them the message in a good, in a good way. And his efforts are paying off for one resident. This painting reminds me to wear a mask. It's so colorful you can't continue walking. 
and you turn to look at it. Instantly, you see this woman with a mask in attractive colours, so in your mind, you remember the mask to fight against COVID-19. And there's eight more of these coronavirus-themed murals across the city. It's all a result of the teamwork by the 14 artists involved with the NGO. We believe that only one man can give the whole idea. So we, we discuss, we take decision and then we, we make in practice what we have been talking about and also all the details because we need to have a specific message to tell. Rwanda has recorded more than 4,000 cases and 19 deaths related to COVID-19. And Kurema's founder says they want to help keep the numbers as low as possible. It's a way to come together uh, conceptually to benefit and enjoy the value of artwork in society. And so we hope that these messages both have an educational function, but can also encourage and inspire people to keep going, to keep fighting against this fight. And although the World Health Organization says the coronavirus won't be leaving Rwanda anytime soon, Kurema is already planning its next post-COVID project. It wants to focus on protecting the environment as a reminder that our health is linked to the planets. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Insta and Twitter page has more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilf Berekitli, thanks for watching, bye for now.